It is my pleasure to welcome you to our latest talk in Engineering Entrepreneurship Distinguished Speaker Series. The Engineering Entrepreneurship programs are designed to inspire and promote the commercialization of new technology and to better the world. They focus on sophisticated technology for sophisticated companies that stimulate our economy, improve our standard of living. The purpose of these talks, the one we're here for tonight, is to celebrate and disseminate best practices in the alchemy of engineering entrepreneurship, what we sometimes call the real business of engineering. This series is sponsored by the law firm Caldwell, Cassidy & Curry, an innovator in the practice of intellectual property law, and the Linda and Mitch Hart Institute for Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship, an initiative that's come to be known as the High Tie. The Hart Institute combines the resources, expertise, and guidance of the Lyle School of Engineering and the Cox School of Business to develop technology prototypes and viable business plans. Representing Caldwell, Cassidy, and Curry tonight, we have with us Austin Curry, co-founding partner and SMU Lyle alumnus. Let's give Austin a round of applause. And we're also privileged to have with us Mitch Hart, SMU Trustee Emeritus, who along with Linda Hart is the founding benefactor of the Hart Institute for Technology, Innovation, and Engineering. Please join me in welcoming Mitch. So Mitch is one of our trustee members. Another one is our speaker here tonight. I don't believe we have any other of SMU Board of Trustees. If you do, raise your hand quickly. Seeing none, I'd like to recognize. <laughs> You're not on the SMU Board of Trustees. You are on the Lyle Executive Board as chair. <laughs> Would the Lyle Executive Board members please stand and be recognized? Come on, Rick. <laughs> Thank you. Now, as for the rest of us, we're so glad to have you here as well. Whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur, an investor, a mentor, a student of the field, a champion of others, or just someone who loves a fascinating story, you've come to the right place. Thank you for being here. Our format tonight will be an interview and a curated question and answer. Should, you should have note cards to record your questions, and if you pass them along the aisle, our volunteers will collect them and deliver them up to the interview. Let me first start by beginning to introduce our interviewer. Tonight, our speaker will be interviewed by the Lyle Chair and Associate Dean of Engineering Entrepreneurship and Executive Director of the Hart Institute for Technology, Innovation, and in in Entrepreneurship, Professor Duncan McFarlane. Professor McFarlane's career spans academia and industry, organizations both big and small. In all of his roles at SMU, he's nurturing technologies and business plans that target the engineering industry sectors in DFW that have contributed so much to the community and the world for many decades. And now for our featured guest. Tonight we have a very special treat, as our engineering entrepreneur in the spotlight is Dr. Bobby Lyle. Dr. Lyle has excelled as an engineer, corporate executive, entrepreneur, civic leader, professor, and academic administrator. He served as an SMU trustee for over 20 years and is a long-standing member of the executive board of both the Lyle School of Engineering and the Cox School of Business. Dr. Lyle has helped in the creation, transformation, and success of organizations all across North Texas and beyond. Frankly, I've yet to meet a leader in the Dallas area who, upon learning that I am the dean of the Lyle School of Engineering, doesn't immediately remark on how Bobby Lyle has impacted their organization, their community, and their life. Tonight's conversation will focus on his history of harnessing advanced technology for the success in business. So without further ado, I give you a conversation with Bobby B. Lyle. Let's go home. <laughs> Let's go home? No. In a little bit, Bobby. Um, thank you all very much for coming, and Bobby, especially you for coming out, and really appreciate it. Um, we're in the Lyle School of Engineering. And so I thought I'd, I thought I'd begin um, at the beginning of your engineering career. Uh, back um, in, the 19, in 1963, you came to Dallas from Louisiana Tech. And what was that first engineering job that you had? It's really interesting because um, I was actually dating when I was in engineering school, I was dating the woman I'm married to now for the second time. <laughs> uh, 
And that's another technical story. <laughs> <laughs> but I was dating Lottie, and I came to Dallas for to celebrate uh, Thanksgiving the year before I moved. And General Dynamics, which was in Fort Worth at the time, in the place where Lockheed uh, Martin is now headquartered, had just gotten a new contract to build a variable pitch wing aircraft that was a multi-service aircraft called the F-111. And they were hiring engineers like they were going out of style. And Louisiana Tech graduated about two weeks before Texas A&M and OU and the University of Texas. So I got a job because I, <laughs> and within two weeks I had seniority. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a structural test engineer. And, and the reason I was there, interestingly, uh, and it has something to do with, with our uh, faculty here in, in a way, uh, in a strange way, I was there because of two faculty members at Louisiana Tech who had worked at General Dynamics and they thought that would be the greatest place in the world for me to go work. And they were probably, uh, you know, pretty close to being right. And so I had the opportunity to go to, uh, to Fort Worth lived in Dallas, commuted to Fort Worth, and worked as a structural test engineer beginning in 1963. Now, if you think about that date, I came in May of 1963, and most people in the room remember what happened in November of 1963. And I was working the night shift at uh, General Dynamics went to work that night on a Friday night, on a Thursday night, came home, went to my apartment, which overlooked Lemon Avenue, and was awakened at 11 o'clock in the morning by a noise outside my window, and opened up the drapes and looked down, and President Kennedy's motorcade had stopped right below my window. And so I saw him and watched as he shook hands and Governor Conley and the motorcade shook hands with people on the street and then they left. And about 30 minutes later, my roommate called me and said, are you watching TV? And I said, no. And he said, well, turn the TV on. The president's been killed. I said, the president has not been killed. I just saw him. He said, turn the TV on. And sure enough, of course, he had been. But I saw the president about 30 minutes before he was shot. And that's uh, that's something that is an indelible image that you never forget. Most of us in the room who remember exactly where we were when we heard that that uh, announcement. But anyhow, that that was the beginning of a, an engineering career at General Dynamics, and and we were working on things that were just fantastic, frankly. Um, you know, I was working on the hinge pin for that aircraft, and we were building a plane that no one had ever done this before. And, and the fun thing for me was as a structural test engineer, I got to tear it up. <laughs> I, got, I, got to, I got to stress it to the point that it broke. I mean, like a kid, you know, playing with toys. <laughs> and you get, to, you get to stress it until it actually comes apart. And I did that. And unfortunately, it did break. And when you got, when you're building a plane for the Air Force, you know, that's one thing. You're building a plane for the Marines, that's another thing. You're building a plane for the Navy, that's another thing. You build it for all of them. The next morning after it broke, it looked like the Pentagon had descended upon my little <laughs> test jig. <laughs> and it was, it was an interesting experience. So, you, so how long were you at General Dynamics? Actually, I was only there a year. Okay. And then... But <laughs> I broke the toy. <laughs> you broke the toy? <laughs> no, actually, but, no, I was there for a year. Yeah. But then, but then, you, then you went into a, to a, a geophysical, geotechnical company. I did. I went to work for a company. That, but... Let me tell you just one story about leaving because I really didn't get fired. <laughs> I was standing up on the mezzanine one day at lunch and General Dynamics had a mile long assembly plant 
And literally, it was a mile long. It was, it was not supposed to have been a mile, but we're in Texas, and when it was built, they said, we have to make it bigger, longer than any <laughs> other assembly line in the country, and so it has to be a mile, so they extended it about this much. So there's a mile long <laughs> assembly line, and I was looking down the assembly line, and my, my immediate supervisor was with me, and, and I looked down and I said, what do you want to do next? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, don't you want to own some of this? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, what I want to do is go back to my desk and I want to eat what's in this brown bag and I think you should do the same thing. And that's when I knew that I was in the wrong place. And, and so I went to, my, went to the head of the test lab and told him kind of what my thoughts were. And he said, well, you know, he said, you've gotten four raises in, in six months and nine months. And he said, uh, you, you've got a great future here. He said, but I understand. He said, go with my blessing and go do what you need to do. So I came, went to work for, for uh, Geotech, which is a geophysical company. And we were working with very high, uh, sophist very sophisticated seismometers. This came out of the oil and gas industry, but we were doing we were monitoring nuclear tests for the Air Force. And we were working with such sophisticated equipment that if you sneezed in Moscow, I could tell you what kind of Kleenex you used. <laughs> I mean, it, it was incredible. And we were monitoring, we had 57 recording stations around the world. We were monitoring 365 days a year, all day, all night, 24 hours a day. And that was really an exciting experience as well. Now, going, going back to Louisiana Tech, um, yeah. you, uh, you studied a little bit of thermodynamics there. <laughs> this, do you really want to hear that? Well, <laughs> I have to get you into SMU engineering school. <laughs> so we, we, you can, we can take that any way you want. Well. <laughs> There was a, a really, really fine young engineer who was on this faculty at, at SMU when I applied for graduate school. And he, he was an expert in thermodynamics. And so I was sitting in his office interviewing, trying to get into school, and there was a construction job going on right outside of Carruth Hall, not the Carruth Hall here, but the old Carruth Hall. And there was a construction job going on and there was a jackhammer outside. And so I was sitting across the desk from him and he wanted to talk about thermodynamics. And he said, uh, tell me about your thermodynamics experience at Louisiana Tech. And I thought, oh my God, this is the end of this conversation. <laughs> uh, because when, when I answered the question, he thought that I said I had taken thermodynamics one, two, and three. What I said was I would taken thermodynamics one three times. <laughs> fortunately, the jackhammer came along at exactly the right time and I was admitted to school. So I, came, I got into school and, and I did okay. <laughs> But I, but I went to graduate engineering school here, but what I really wanted to do was to get an MBA. And Shane Goodwin, who's the associate dean of the Cox <laughs> School now, if Shane been there, I, I might have gotten in. But uh, I, I, I couldn't go to get a, an MBA because my company, Geotech, would not pay for it, and I didn't have enough money to pay for it myself. So I could get in the engineering school, and they would pay for that. So I started taking courses in the business school. And through an unusual set of circumstances, um, wound up getting the first funded research grant in the history of the business school, which they thought was pretty cool. And then was asked to stay and teach and do research in the business school. And through some unusual set of circumstances, wound up being the interim dean of the business school uh, before it was the Cox School. So there I was as a professor with two degrees in engineering, no degrees in business, and dean of the engineering, uh, dean of the business school. <laughs> and that's where I met Mitch Hart. 
and that was in 1970 when I met Mitch. So that's how long he's been my best friend. So it's good to have him here. And now, he'll, he'll tell me occasionally, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I've learned, you know, doing a little bit of background here, that one of the word um, that was used to describe your work in the SME Business School was creativity. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, a, that's a really, still a very, very important theme within the Lyle School of Engineering. Um, and so I, I want to kind of dig into this idea of, 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 you know, this hallmark of creativity in your, in your, in your career. Certainly, in, it, it's, a, it's manifest in engineering, but you've also, you've also kind of applied it very, very well in the business sector. So, but to begin, could you talk a little bit about how important creativity is to an organization? in general, and also to you personally? Wow, that's, that's one of those uh, questions that you talk about all night, probably, but it started for me when I was in, really, when I was in the business school. <clears throat> um, we, we really took that to a new level in terms of introducing the whole concept of creativity in the classroom and, and also in the research that we were doing within the school. And it just, it, it stuck. I mean, we literally, uh, we had a, a friend of mine who was there with me in the, in the business school who had been hired by Sun Oil Company to actually do a, a program on creativity for the, the engineers in Sun Oil to try to stimulate more creative thought, more creative action. It was actually called Blocks to Creativity, and we use that in the classroom. We took that, and from my standpoint, I took the concepts that we were using and used that not only in running the school, but also once I left uh, academia and went into to business, used it in, in the businesses uh, that I was involved in. And I personally think that there are ways that you can encourage and stimulate creative thought and creative action uh, in among uh, uh, you know, associates, and, and I think it has a positive impact on whatever you do. Um, you left, uh, you left SMU for a while. Yeah. Um, you went up to Massachusetts. I did. I uh, started working on a doctorate. Um, we, you know, it has a rollback just a little bit. Um, the school, the Cox, what is now the Cox School, at the time that I went, was there, was not anything like it is today. Um, it was a good regional school. We were fortunate in that one of uh, Mitch's associates, uh, Ross Perot, decided that he wanted to give the, the uh, uh, business school $50,000 to do strategic planning to make it one of the best graduate schools in the Southwest. And I was lucky enough to have been asked to take on the chairmanship, if you will, of the committee that put that plan together. And so that was something that really was the foundation for what we have now as the Cox School of Business, because we did things to turn the school around, much in the same way that I think we did uh, a few years ago, 11 years ago, with the School of Engineering. We said, let's do something that will really make this a top-notch school, not just a good regional school. Well, we did that in 1970 in the business school. And I had the opportunity to, to be very much involved with that, but I, as we finished that, I decided that I needed to make a career move. I needed to either make a commitment to stay in a university and either be a, an administrator or a professor or whatever, or I needed to go do something else. And what I really wanted to do was to pursue a, a dream to go practice what I was preaching. And in order to, but I, but I also, I liked what I was doing in the university, but I knew if I was going to stay, I needed to go and finish work on a doctorate, which I had started at the University of Massachusetts. So I took a leave of absence and went up and, 
and worked with a, a man who became a very good friend of mine, a man named Ken Blanchard, uh, who was my dissertation chairman, and you may know of him. He wrote a series of books <coughs> called The One Minute Manager and got rich doing that. But, uh, but I went up and studied with Ken. But he wasn't your first mentor. He wasn't my first mentor. You had a, didn't you have a very good mentor in the, in the business school? Oh, I did, yeah, absolutely. I had, had a lot of mentors, and, but one was a man named Jack Grayson, who was the dean of the business school. Uh, when, when, when I became dean, Jack, Jack was the dean, and he was chosen to go and run the price commission under the Nixon administration. And so when he did that, I was asked to come in and, and be the dean of the school. But Jack and I worked together for about eight years. And it was an incredible experience. He was, he truly was one of the most creative people I've ever known. Um, he was a little strange in many ways, but he was, he was really, was one of the most creative people I've ever known. And uh, I learned a lot from him, yeah. So a, a couple of things uh, about your time at, in, in, in Boston. Um, uh, for fun, you made a little money on the side, right? Well, not a lot, but. Not a lot, but a little money. <laughs> yeah, I made $25,000 trading junk bonds. <laughs> and, uh, and when I came back to Dallas, I came back to start a, an investment banking firm that would specialize in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. and, and that's all the money I had was $25,000. So. The, the, um, your doctorate, is in strategic planning and leadership. Right. Um, how does that how does that relate to creativity? Does it does it enhance it? Does it provide structure for it? Does it be does it allow creativity to be more effective? Well, the uh, there's a discipline for me that uh, goes along with strategic planning. Creativity is a part of that discipline. It's a part of the mindset. I think that, that you, you really, you need to let yourself go. You need to be expansive for as long as you can and then you need to come back to specifics. So you start with, with broad general concepts and then you're narrowing those to things that result in action steps from day one uh, forward. That whole creativity piece of that is a critical dimension, critical element of, of strategic planning. If you don't have that, you miss out, I think, on the opportunities that um, avail themselves to, it, to you and your company if you open yourself up at the very beginning and really let the creative juices flow. But then at some point, Sooner or later, everything degenerates into work, and you've got to bring it down to something that you can use then to implement from step one to uh, step one uh, forward. So you're back in Dallas. Yeah. You have a small little kitty that you created. Yeah. Um, this is about the time that you met. We're we're in the Vester Hughes Auditorium, and this is about the time that you. You, you worked with him, you, you met with him. Yeah, th this is really, for me, this is really a, a special place to be because of Bester, because I was sitting there getting ready to start this investment banking firm and I got a call from Bester. And many of you <coughs> know Bester, Mitch knew him very, very well. Vester was probably one of the best tax attorneys in the world at the time. And Top five. yeah, just outstanding. And he called and he said, uh, could you have lunch with me? And I said, well, yeah, you want to do it next week? He said, no, I want to do it today. <laughs> and, 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 and that's, uh, he, he, he's kind of like Mitch, you know, when you get a call from Mitch and he says, I'd like to do it today, you don't say, well, Mitch, I can't do that. You say, okay, I'm, I'll be there. So I went downtown and had lunch with Bester, and I said, I said why, what, what's up? He said, well, I'm, I'm on the board of, and I'm counsel for this small 
independent oil and gas company in Dallas, and it's coming out of trust, and it's coming back under the ownership of, of the, the woman who is the child of the, of the man who had started the company. And I need to know what to do with it. She said, I, I, I've talked to other people. I've talked to Ed Cox. I've talked to Ray Hunt. I've talked to Larry Foraker, who was one of the uh, deans of the business schools in the country. He said, he said, I just want to know what you think I should do with this company. And so we talked for about three hours. And uh, we finished talking. And, and I said, OK, what's, what's going to happen, Bester, that you would think it would be a good idea that you bought my lunch today because he was paying. <laughs> and and uh, he said, well, that you'd go home and think about this and call me and tell me you'd run this company. And I said, I have no interest in running somebody else's company. And he said, well, why not? I said, because I've told you I'm going to start my own company. He said, well, you're going to need some money. And I said, well, that's pretty absorbent. I said, yes, that's, <laughs> that's right. And, and he said, suppose that we could structure a deal where the company, everything that's in the company today would stay in the company, but everything you did that's new, you would own part of it, and the company would put up all the money. And I said, gee, that's the best deal I've had, that's the best <laughs> offer I'd have had today. And so I said, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go do strategic planning for the company for three months. And if what I think you should do is what you want to do, then we'll talk about a, a relationship. Well, about 30 days into that experience, they called and said, would you come and take the company and run it? So my first job was not actually to start a company in that was a, uh, an investment banking company or a venture company, it was to be the president of an independent oil and gas company. And it turned out, I mean, it, it, it was an excellent company, number one. Uh, they had wonderful assets. And so, uh, but they were not taking any risk. I mean, you think about oil and gas companies as being somewhat risky investment. They were not taking risks. They were cashing checks and buying T-bills. I mean, literally, that's not an exaggeration. And so I, I said, you know, we really need to do something different. And, and so I wanted to, to diversify somewhere. And I picked real estate as the area to diversify into. And so the first real estate project that I did was I bought the land at the, what is now the intersection of LBJ Freeway and the Tollway. And we built the Dallas Galleria there. And uh, so that was, you know, that was kind of a neat deal. Um, and Jerry Hines was our partner, and he, he had built the Houston Gallery, and we partnered with Jerry to build the one in, in Dallas. And it, it taught me a lot. Um, one of the things it taught me was, when I, I asked, this is kind of an interesting financial engineering uh, study, but, I, my exposure to real estate up to that point was you borrowed as much money as you possibly could to do your venture. And when I asked Jerry how we were gonna, who we were going to borrow the money from, he said, we're not going to borrow any money. Now, this was 1979. And I said, well, wait a minute. This, this is a $465 million project, and you're telling me we're not going to borrow any money. He said, no, we're going to do it all with cash. It's a 100% equity deal. I said, well, I'd, who's going to raise the money? He said, you leave that up to me. Well, sure enough, we did. We didn't put any debt on the property at all. And the equity partner was the Kuwait Investment Company. And so the, the project, fortunately, was built with no debt. Because, for those of you who are around, you will remember that the early 80s were not good years for real estate. And we opened the Galleria in 1981. I had just decided a few months before we opened the Galleria that I was going to leave Cornell Oil Company and start my own company called Lyco Energy. And we opened the Galleria and the real estate market went to pot. The oil and gas industry went to pot. And here I was <laughs> starting a new company, 
that was based upon an equity base that was in real estate and in oil and gas. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you talk about bad timing. That was not particularly good timing, but we did it. But that timing also created some opportunities for you. Created great opportunities, yeah, yeah. Because during that same period, everybody wanted to get in the oil business. And if you were selling shoes, you wanted to be in the oil business. If you were raising cows, you wanted to be in the oil business. Everybody wanted to be in the oil business. So when things started going south, my feeling was that if you could raise some money, there were going to be some opportunities because a lot of people were going to be getting out of the oil business. So I was going into the office one morning about 7 o'clock and the, listening to the news, which was my typical pattern, and the announcement was that Bethlehem Steel had just announced the largest quarterly loss in U.S. business history. And so my question to myself as I was driving along was, I wonder if they've been, if they've been in the oil business, you know, during this period. And if so, maybe they'd want to sell something. So I went into the office and my CFO was standing there and I asked him if he knew anybody at Bethlehem Steel. And he said, yeah, I went to law school with the guy at Duke that is on the staff at Bethlehem. So I said, call him. So we did, he did, and he came back in. He said, they, they do have oil and gas properties and they want to sell them. And I said, well, that's interesting. Could you get me a phone number to call? And I did. And so we talked and they, they said, uh, yeah, we do have oil and gas properties in Oklahoma, deep gas, and we have deep gas in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, those were two places that if you were in the oil and gas business at that moment in time, and you needed money from banks, you did not want to be there because those were just, those, those were not the words you wanted to hear. But we looked at the, at the deal and, and they said, come on up to, to Bethlehem and, uh, and by the way, send us, send us some information on your company. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't have any information on my company. <laughs> And so I sent, I, literally, I sent them my resume. And I said, we're, we're a young company. We're just starting out. And <clears throat> believe it or not, they called back and invited us to go to Bethlehem to look at what they had. And so we had a meeting at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I had specifically decided not to go because I was fearful that if I was there, and they started asking questions, they would expect me to have the answers to the questions, and, and I didn't think they were gonna like what I was gonna be able to tell them. And so I sent three engineers. They had a, three, had a two o'clock meeting, and at 2.15 they called me and they said, we've got a real problem. I said, what's the problem? <laughs> they said, they are serious, they do have oil and gas properties, they've got all this material boxed up, and what do we do? Because we'd never bought anything. <laughs> I said, ask them to give you a private room, put all the boxes in there, and play like you know what you're doing. <laughs> and, they, and they did. And they did. And so we found out, I mean, as, as we evaluated the properties, we found out that they had excellent properties. Bethlehem had spent about $150 million on getting the asset base they had, which was now worth about 50. They'd never made any money, but they had excellent properties. So we started the evaluation process and I told them from the very beginning, I said, look, I don't have any money. And, but I think that I can go into the institutional marketplace and get the money to buy the properties. And they said, okay, keep, keep evaluating. They said, how much do you think you'll have to borrow? How much do you think the banks will lend you on this? And I said, well, probably $30 million. And I said, that means that I'll buy the, the properties from you for 50. I'll give you a $10 million back in after I get my money back. You'll get a $10 million back in after payout, but you've got to lend me $10 million to make up the 50. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, go to the bank and see if you can borrow the $30 million. So I did. We started uh, evaluating and uh, two weeks went by. We, we had two weeks to to finish this process. Two weeks went by and um, 
the bank had told me they thought they'd be able to lend $30 million. I told Bethlehem that they would do that, but we didn't have all of our due diligence done and we didn't have all of our legal work done. And I said, we, don't even, we can't even verify that we're buying what we think we're buying from you. So you're gonna have to give me the full faith and credit of Bethlehem Steel behind this deal in order for me to be able to finance it at the bank. They said, we've never done that. I said, well, fine, this is a short conversation. <laughs> they said, you go to the bank and we'll talk about it. I went back, I did that, went back and talked to them. They said, we're gonna give you the full faith and credit of Bethlehem Steel behind the deal. It, it'll be guaranteed that it's worth what you're paying. And we're gonna lend you $10 million for six months. I said, that's just enough time to get me in real deep doo-doo. <laughs> so I and they said, well, what do you need? I said, I need the money for 18 months. And they said, okay, we'll do it for 18 months. You keep going. So the day comes for closing. I go down to, the, to my attorney's office. The guy from Bethlehem is sitting down in the, in the lobby in the Hotel of the Americas. I get a call from my attorney's office upstairs and I go up to take the call and it's the bank. They said, we've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is we're gonna lend you some money. The bad news is we can only lend you $20 million, not 30. I said, is that a firm offer? And they said, yes. I went downstairs, met with a guy in the, in the lobby uh, of the hotel I said, I've got some good news and bad news. I said, I, I, the bank's going to lend me some money, but they're only going to lend me 20, not 30. That means that you've got to lend me 20, <laughs> not 10. And he said, Bobby, if I do that deal, I will get fired. And I said, I understand this has been a great experience stop the waitress and I said would you bring two beers because my friend's getting ready to go back to Bethlehem Pennsylvania he said but if I don't do the deal they'll kill me he said go draw the paper <laughs> so that night we closed the deal with 20 million dollars from Republic Bank or from Interfirst Bank uh, actually First Republic by that time 20 million dollars from the bank 20 million dollar loan from Bethlehem Steel for 18 months and a 10 million dollar back end after payout for 50 million dollars and no cash I could not do that deal today period <laughs> but it was a time when circumstances were such I didn't know why they were doing it until after the deal had closed and the deal had to be closed by the end of June in order for the man who did the deal with me to be promoted the Vice President of Finance in Bethlehem Steel. <laughs> and that's, that started out, that's, that started us down the path of, of acquisitions and trying to take advantage of a market that was, had, was just going to pot. And it turned out that that was, really was one of the best acquisitions that was made in the country that year. <coughs> and that took me, that was on the, 20, that was on the, the 30th of, of June on the 23rd of December, I put it into a, a partnership with Prudential Insurance, Minnesota Mutual, New York Life, and two of my shareholders, and put $42.5 million into the deal. We took $2.5 million out, put $40 million in it, paid off all the loans, and uh, then we, that's what launched us. A little bit of risk. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of risk. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit of risk because I had to personally guarantee the loan. And I remember sitting there, and, uh, and Mitch can appreciate this, uh, sitting there, and when you start to sign your name to, <laughs> and you, when you don't have any money, and you start to sign your name to a, what amounted to a, a $20 million bank loan, and then another $20 million to Bethlehem for its loan, and you're personally guaranteeing that. And I remember my CFO said, he stopped me and he said, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, yeah, I'm sure I don't want to do what I'm about to do. But, but if I don't do it, we're not going to make this deal. And so I did. And so, but we paid it off in six months. Yeah. And, Incredible. And that was, the, that was the beginning. So, Technology and the energy sector. Yep. That your you brought that first to to Cornell, right? Right. 
And then you you certainly brought that to Lyco. Yeah. Yeah, we did some interesting things that literally had never been done before, ever, in the history of the industry. Uh, and when I was at Cornell, we did a we did a thing that really was an interesting combination of, of financial engineering and then the engineering of drilling and completing wells. Uh, Bester and I got the Department of Energy to create a financing mechanism for companies that had, and, and for those of you who, who may not remember or are you too young to remember, in, in the late 70s, you sold oil for what was known as control prices and then you sold oil at market price. And to give you an example of the differential, control prices were about $5.50 a barrel. Market price was $17.50 a barrel. That's a pretty big spread. That literally meant that if you had a well here that was classified as an old well, that means that it had been drilled before a certain date, you would sell oil out of that well for $5.50 a barrel. If you drilled a new well here and were selling oil out of a new well, you could sell it for $17.50. Makes a lot of sense, right? So, anyhow, but that was the world we were living in. So Vester and I got the Department of Energy to agree to a program that if you had an old well here, that you were willing to take the difference between what you could sell the oil for at $5.50 a barrel and $17.50 a barrel, take the differential and put it into a qualified enhanced oil recovery project, you could sell that oil for market price. There were finally, at the end of the day, there were 450 projects across the country that were qualified for that type of financing. And we had the 001 project and the 008 project. The 001 project was using a technology that was, uh, we did something that literally had never been done. We drilled a six foot diameter hole 500 feet deep, lowered mining equipment down, excavated out a pressure vessel, a huge 25, diameter, uh, 25 foot diameter room, lowered mining equipment down into that 500 foot hole in the, in the oil sands, uh, the heavy oil sands in California, and drilled horizontal wells out into the formation alternately with one, one of the wells being an injection well for steam, the, the next uh, well over being the production well to take the oil out and put uh, an enormous uh, uh, pump jacks to get this oil out of the ground. And, and it had never been done before. It was, a, it was an engineering marvel mm. and it was an engineering success, mm. but it was a financial failure <laughs> because <laughs> because the only way you could afford to do it was through that financing vehicle that I just mentioned. If you, just, if you didn't have that subsidy, mm -hmm. it, was, it didn't make economic mm -hmm. sense. So we did it, and we proved that it worked, and then we sold it to ExxonMobil. So that was, that was kind of a neat, neat thing to do. And we carried that whole concept of, of taking technology and not being afraid to do things that had never been done before, and made uh, successes out of oil fields which were deemed to be uh, non-economic and we made them economic and we did that in, in Colorado, we did it in, in West Texas and we did it, we put it on steroids in, in Montana because we had an opportunity in Montana to do something that uh, really turned out to be incredibly successful um, we, we there's a formation in, in Montana and in North Dakota and now up into Canada called the Bakken. And if, if you read any oil and gas literature, or if you've read any oil and gas literature, particularly in the last 20 or 30 years, then the Bakken is something that, a term that you would recognize. 
But we, we understood that the Bakken Formation in Richland County, Montana, which was the, the, the worst producing county in the entire state of Montana, but we knew that the oil was there. But it couldn't, it, it couldn't get it out of the ground economically. So we decided that if we could fracture stimulate this particular zone, which was about 10,500 feet deep, if we could fracture stimulate it, we thought that we could produce commercial oil. And we tried to do that in vertical wells. And we took a, a, a we, our approach was to go back, go into the field and re-enter old wells first, rather than having to drill new ones, and to try the concept. And, and it worked. And we made more oil than any vertical Bakken wells had ever made in the state. The only problem was it was not economic to drill from the surface. You had to have that subsidy, if you will, you had to have that help in the form of a well that was already there. Mm -hmm. So we had a problem. We knew the oil was there and we knew it was pervasive. It was, it was all over that county or all over the area that we were in. So <coughs> I came back to the office and we were scratching our heads and this formation was about 26 feet thick. And it looked like an Oreo cookie. You had shale on the top, you had shale on the bottom, and you had a dolomite in between that looked mm. like that white, really fun things to, thing to eat in an Oreo cookie. <laughs> filling. And I thought, okay, if, if we can drill a well 10,500 feet deep <laughs> and then turn and go horizontally in that filling and drill out 3,000 feet, horizontally. Now instead of 26 feet of formation, we can, we've got 3,000 feet. And there were only two real problems with that concept. <laughs> One was it had never been done before. <coughs> and the second was we didn't have any money to do it. <laughs> so I was talking to my friendly banker and he said, <laughs> And he said, you know, I've just heard that Halliburton has decided to put money with independent oil and gas companies selectively to use some of the Halliburton technology to exploit oil fields with independent operators. And he said, you might want to talk to them. Well, as it turned out, a guy named Dick Cheney who was, pre who was chairman of the board of Halliburton, also was on the board of trustees at SMU. And Dick and I, and, and, and actually I've been on the board of trustees for over 30 years, not 20 years. So <laughs> it goes back a little bit further. But anyhow, I called Dick and I, I told him what I had in mind. And he said, well, that's, that's a good idea. Let me set up a meeting for you in, Houston, in, uh, in uh, uh, Denver and go up and talk to the people there and see what they think about it. So we loaded up and went to Denver and we were in a room with about 15 Halliburton experts in, in the field of, of drilling, completion, fracturing, every, every technology that you can think of to drill deep wells in, uh, in, in formations like this. And there were three of us, and we were making our presentation, and you know we didn't know what in the world the response was going to be. And so we, they, we made our presentation, we left, they asked us to leave the room, and we came back and they said, uh, we think this will work. And so I said, well, great. And so we started talking about how we are going to, I said, I, they said, what do you want us to do? I said, I want you to drill three wells for me, and I want you to put up all the money. <laughs> And uh, they said, well, the money's not a problem. They said, no, great. Uh, <laughs> they said, but uh, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do three. We'll do one well. So, well, that's, you know, that's the best offer I've got. That was a big mistake for Halliburton, by the way, yeah. because it worked. And now I was in the leverage position because I had all the acreage, and they could have made a much better deal if they said, look, let us do multiple wells for you. 
So anyhow, we were going to drill a 10,500-foot vertical well and a 3,000-foot horizontal well and fracture stimulate it. It had never been done before, not at that depth. So we get down to the, the 10,500 was a piece of cake. It's just a vertical well. Mm -hmm. But then you start turning into the formation. And so what happens? Well, bad things can happen to you when you're doing that. And one of the bad things that happens is that your drill pipe starts to torque on you. And if you're not careful, it'll twist off. We were out 1,700 feet into the horizontal formation and the drill pipe started torquing on us. And Halliburton called and said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I, I want to stop because if we twist this pipe off, I'll never get you back to this point. And I said, I think we've got enough horizontal uh, formation to test the concept. So we stopped. Everybody agreed we stopped. And lo and behold, uh, we thought we were going to have to go in and fracture stimulate this well. The well actually started flowing on us. It was a much better uh, success than, than we had anticipated. We subsequently uh, did fracture stimulate it, and it was really, really a good well. And it set off what was touted at the time as being the largest discovery in the United States in the 20-year period before that. And uh, we subsequently drilled about 80 wells. We never had a dry hole. We, we, didn't, we didn't think we'd ever have a dry hole, and we, and we didn't. But we also drilled the longest horizontal well in the history of Montana. And if you add the vertical and horizontal section to it, it was about 19,500 feet. Wow. And, and if you think about that, 26 feet, you know, how, how tall yeah. is this? It's about eight, 20 feet, maybe 18, yeah. 20 feet. So 26 feet, and you're pushing a piece of spaghetti with a drill bit that's about this big around, and you're doing it blindfolded. Mm -hmm. The technology is absolutely incredible. And, and you know, it's not like you're just out there. <laughs> it's up and down and up and down. Anyhow, we, we did that. We fracture stimulated the well, and uh, it set off a play that was just, it was phenomenal. And that made like a, a success. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. A little bit of one. Yeah. But, but one of the fun things was <clears throat> that after the first well was, as I said, Halliburton really did make a mistake by only drilling one well. Right. But, but it was the right decision for them. Mm -hmm. But... They came back and said, okay, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want you to drill 10 wells for me, and we're going to test the entire acreage block mm -hmm. that we have. And they said, why do you want to drill 10? I said, because I want to know what the extent is. I said, okay. So they drilled 10 wells, and uh, they were my partner, and they were, they were a fabulous partner. Um, and they, they drilled every well that we drilled until we sold the company. They drilled with us. And... Uh, and but then once I mean and, and when we went there 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 were there were no services there everybody had left the state had left the uh, the basin and the the uh, the county went from being the worst producing county in the state of Mo uh, Montana to the best producing county I mean at that point and I took Mitch up and the board up, uh, and Mitch, by the way, was on my board for 26 years. And, uh, but uh, we went up, uh, took Mitch's plane, went up to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the lease so they could see what was going on. And if you, if you wanted to go someplace where your kids would have a great experience in school, it was the richest school district in the world <laughs> in this little town of Sydney, Montana. And so, but anyhow, it, it turned out to be just an, an unbelievable experience, and, and uh, technology led the way. There was no question about that. And, but also it was convincing people to do something that had never been done. And that's the fun part about it. I mean, um, and, and we did that. And so that little company, uh, you know, 
turned out that a group out of Canada called Interplus, which was a Canadian royalty trust, and they had nothing in the United States at the time, and they decided that they wanted to make an entry into the United States, and so we decided that it was time for us to monetize what we had, and so we packaged it up and sold it. Sold it for $421 million, I think, right? And uh, so it was, a, it was a nice payday. And there's, there's, there's a, a component to that, which I think is an important kind of entrepreneurial component as well in building companies. The day that we sold that company, that we sold our company, every single employee in the company had ownership in the company. A woman who had worked with me as a cash manager for 19 years, she made $50,000 a year. The day that we sold the company, we deposited a $500,000 check into her bank account. That made the whole thing worthwhile. Yeah. And, and every single one of the, the employees did well. And she was an example. But, uh, you know, they worked, worked hard. And as Mitch knows, there, there, there were days when, um, you know, it was hard to pay the bills. And uh, there, were, there were days when the bills were paid out of my bank account. And because the company didn't have the money to pay it. So technology? Yeah. Courage? Yeah. And people? Absolutely. And the people around you, you are properly loved, adored, but you also had a lot of help along the way to get where you are. So thoughts about, for an entrepreneur, about relationships with people and... Yeah, yeah, and, and if you, yeah, it, and that's a great point. And if you run into people and entrepreneurs and they, it's all about I, 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 I'll tell you what, if you ever see a turtle on a fence post, you can guarantee one thing. He didn't get there by himself. <laughs> and, and, and I guarantee you that, that, that that's my experience. I mean, I had great, great people. I had loyal people and, and uh, that, that worked uh, with me. I, they didn't work for me. They worked with me. And I had a board that believed in what we were doing. And you know, the payoff for the board for a long time was, was lunch every quarter. I mean, right? And that, that was it. But I had, the, the board members were wonderful. But I did, I would have to say one thing, and, and Mitch lived through this, and so he, he appreciates it, and he was there. But I had one board member that after we drilled the first well, he said, we got to sell the company. I said, no, we can't sell it. We're not selling the company now. He said, well, we've, we've got a successful well. I said, but we're not, we're not drilling a well. We're not building a well. We're building a company. And he said, well, how will you know when it's time to sell? I said, trust me, I'll know when it's time. We drill the second well. He said, now is it time? He asked me that question every time I saw him. Is it time? No. And, and so another thing that, that was required was the, kind of the strength of your conviction. When you, when you really feel like you, you know what the right path is, have the strength of your conviction to, to pursue that. And get people like Mitch Hart who believe in you, who can say to another board member, sit down and just be patient. <laughs> that helps. So you've taken that, you've taken that fortune, that success, and you've given back with an immense generosity. And, you know, most, just a couple, um, Mark's been giving me the eye over there, so we're going to wrap up a little bit. But most recently, you've made another, just another wonderfully generous gift to, to the Lyle School. And, you know, what are your thoughts and your motivations and your hopes behind that gift? It's all about the kids. And uh, say kids, it's all about the young people who are in the, the students who are in the program, and and it's all about the faculty. It's all about creating new knowledge. It's all about taking risk. 
helping people understand that it's okay to fail. It's not okay not to try. But it, try and fail if you have to. Fail as fast as you can, but uh, don't, don't be afraid of failure. And to try to, to build a school that that's a part of the DNA, that that's part of the culture, and that innovation and creativity and collaboration and, and, and hard work, I mean, there's nothing wrong with hard work. Um, try to do it smartly, but hard work's okay. And, but also to have fun and to have a school that has that kind of DNA is what I aspire for us to do. I don't aspire for us to be like Rice or Texas A&M or OU or the University of Texas. They've already done that and they're gonna keep doing that and they're bigger than we are, but they don't need to be better than we are and they need to, we need to be different. And that's what I wanted to, to try to do. That's what I wanna to try to do in, in, in 1970 when we were working together on the business school and that's what I had aspired for us to do when we started this process with the engineering school. That was the, the aspiration, to do something that was unique, to do something that was, that was truly um, an opportunity that, that students really couldn't find other places. And, and it, you know, it's working. I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's sitting right here, it's sitting, standing over there. It's out here, it's right here, it's on the front row. It is true, Bobby, that exciting mission is really what brings us all to work, you know, yeah, to, to, yeah. to push, to take risks, to be different, yeah. and to be ultimately excellent. Um, thank you so much tonight. Um, I'd like, let's thank our speaker, but I think we also have. But I think we also have time for a couple of curated questions. <laughs> During the, re the reformation of the business school, how did you develop, identify your priority list for that reformation? And what were they? Wow. Priorities. Well, how, how we did that, that's, that's, that's a good question. And one of the things that, that we did not do in 1970 was we didn't sit in the Cox School and design the program. We literally got out and went all over the, we, we went all over the world. Now, did we visit all the countries of the world? No, no, no. But we went around the world talking to people about business education. I mean, business education was really in need of inspiration and change in 1970. And we wanted to be that change agent. And so we went out into the field and we talked, we talked to 250 Fortune 500 CEOs in the process. And we asked them, what, what would happen and what would a student be able to do for you to say that school is doing the best job of any school in the world in preparing young people for careers in business? And you know what answers we got? We, we really weren't that surprised, but we were pleased with the answers. Because not a single one of those respondents said anything about accounting. They didn't say anything about marketing. They didn't say anything about finance. They said, send us people who understand how to write, understand how to speak, understand how to get up in front of a group and make a presentation, who can lead a group. They didn't say anything about the technical portion, uh, part of business. We, before we asked the question, we, we hoped that would be the answer. But we didn't prompt them, we just asked the question and those were the, the answers that came back. And so as we were building the program and making the changes, we integrated that into the curriculum the same way that we wanted to do that in the engineering school 11 years ago. And as Jeffrey Orsak and I started the conversation about the engineering school, 
and you know we want to do something that's very very different and we want to be sure that leadership training is not restricted to the top 10 percent of the class we want to make Absolutely. it available to every single student that comes through the program we want to have programs that emphasize creativity we want to have programs where the students are not confined to the classroom but the classroom is a place where they from time to time drop off and do a few things but they're out in the field where they can get their hands dirty and start working with the problem and then come back and and study the theory that makes this make sense and so that's the way we that's the way we built the school in 1970 the business school around those concepts and that and we prioritized our our programs that would uh, help us do that we had a couple of great questions about the advice that you would give and the differentiation and I think those are the points that we'd want to bring home to our students is that you know stress the leadership stress the decision making communication skills as well as your technical skills yeah. you would you would you agree with that absolutely and and so many schools uh, forget the soft uh, components of of, uh, of the profession and 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 we were hearing from the uh, from the learned yeah. academies that we weren't doing it right the, the engineering schools weren't doing it right and that's what we wanted to address and and yes uh, I, I think that emphasizing that is is something we want to continue for sure and so with that let's thank Dr. Lyle for a fascinating evening Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope you enjoyed the evening, so and I hope you'll consider really joining us for the rest of the uh, Entrepreneurship Great. Speaker yeah. Series. You, In the spring, we've got Thank coming you. up Frank Levinson, co-founder of Finisar and general partner of Phoenix Ventures Managing Director, Dale Faust, CEO of Microbiome Therapeutics, and Lee Elmeyer, CEO of Replicate Dental Technologies. If you keep looking for great stories, keep coming back to us. Bring your friends. I promise we'll find a bigger room. Uh, look in your email for thing, announcements about our Download Breakfast series if you want to hear other stories. And now just one last bit of information and instructions. There's a reception to follow this right now. There are staircases at either end of the wings outside and the world's slowest but safest elevator right <laughs> over side to the right. So I hope you'll all join us upstairs for some merriment and some entrepreneurial collisions. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>